the Necrons may not have ruled the galaxy for any massively long period in history, but the effects of them and their former masters, the Catan, cannot be understated. However, many would be forgiven for forgetting that they were once the flesh and blood Necron tier, a mortal society as opposed to a mechanical one. Much of the history of the Necron tier has been lost, scrubbed away by their biotransference or simply by the passing of time, but some fragments remain even if not everyone knows about it. One of the major ones, technology aside, can be found by looking at the various factions within the Necron race. These are remnants of noble houses with agendas and personalities all of their own, and they are known as the Necron Dynasties. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. Necron tier society is generally a bit of an unknown, but its organisation is at least slightly understood. It was led by an individual known as the Silent King, with a council known as the Triarch around or below them. However, this society was not united and harmonious in any way or thought. The fact it had two major wars of secession within its history should be evidence enough of that. Even when at peace internally, there were several groups who presumably had political sway across Necron tier society, as well as acting as smaller bubbles of political control further afield from the heartlands. These were noble houses, broadly speaking, great families perhaps would be a better term than I think about it, but just how powerful they once were is unclear, the records don't seem to recall. However, they definitely had a fair bit of influence and reach, since they not only survived biotransference as a concept, but were even coded into the newly created Necrons. You see, when the Necron tier became the Necrons, their personalities and whatnot, as well as their souls, were lost, mostly consumed by the ravenous Catan who had initiated the transfer. But for the higher ranking individuals such as overlords and cryptex, these personalities were retained due to a better biotransference process. One might expect that this was how the dynasties survived. The overlords and their closest underlings remembered who they were and what their for biotransference. And yes, I should point out, I will say dynasty and dynasty in this log. I am inconsistent with pronunciation, I apologise. But this idea ran much deeper, as those lower-ranked Necrons who had lost their personalities and sentience were hard-coded with a programming that gave them allegiance to their former dynasty. Assumedly, the civilians that became Necron warriors had worked in a sort of feudal society or were otherwise bound by tradition or geography to a certain dynasty, whereas the soldiery who became Lichgard or Immortals would have been part of the personal dynastic forces anyway. Whether the overlords also received this coding is less clear, but I would suspect they did as an extra layer of security and control to prevent backstabbing, betrayal and all kinds of nonsense that you get with mortals. However, even though the dynasties and their codes were enshrined into every Necron pretty much, I'm not sure how important they initially were following the biotransference due to one major thing, the command protocols held by the Silent King during the War in Heaven. When the Necrons were created from the Necron tier, they were involved in a long and ultimately fruitless war with the incredibly powerful Old Ones and the Eldari in a battle known as the War in Heaven. There's a lot of ancient wars going by that name, don't worry if you can't follow which is which from time to time. In order to ensure the union of the Necrons where the Necron tier were fragmented by civil war, the Silent King was given command protocols that allowed him to lead and control the entire race on his own, and these presumably overruled any dynastic ties that may have caused friction in an already nigh on impossible war. But, thanks to their new forms and the power of the Catan who had gorged on their souls, the Necrons did defeat the Old Ones who eventually, presumably, were wiped out by the warp denizens known as the Enslavers. And when that was done, the Necrons would need that unity more than perhaps even in the War in Heaven, as the Silent King had a new enemy for them to face, the Catan who had stolen his species' souls in the first place. I'll spare you the details, I'm sure I've mentioned it in at least one log up to this point, but the Necrons did win, shattering the Catan and trapping their shards in Tesseract Labyrinths. At that time, the Silent King made an arguably impractical decision, relinquishing and severing the command protocols that had held dominance over his race. You might ask why? 
Simple. He didn't want them. He felt great shame for allowing the biotransference to happen, and whilst he still wished for the Necrons to dominate and conquer the galaxy, I doubt it was his vision for them to give up so much to make it happen. So when he ordered the Necrons to sleep, to wait for the galaxy to become ripe for conquest again rather than die at the hands of the rising Eldari, he cut the highest command protocols and alas allowed the Necrons to take the Milky Way back on their own terms. This presumably meant that the dynastic allegiances that had been hardwired into the Necrons became the highest ranking command protocols if there were any at all left. And as a result, the Phaerons, the name for the highest ranking overlords in particularly large dynasties, have been left to lead for themselves in their own quirky ways. This unsurprisingly has bred mistrust and even hostility between dynasties at one point or another. Heck, you only have to look at the scheming and politicking that goes on within a dynasty's command structure to get an idea of just how frictional this whole lot is. Lords try to usurp overlords, cryptex play individuals off against each other, it's a big old mess. After all, the wars of secession in Necron tier times show that this was not a united race as I mentioned before. No mortal or immortal society ever truly is. Even demons and the Tau have issues with discord if you need more examples. As concerns some things more logistical than political regarding the dynasties, uh, the structure will of course be influenced by size, but generally seems pretty uniform as a rule of thumb. At the top is an overlord, or a pharaon if the dynasty is large enough to warrant having multiple overlords. They will usually rule the capital world or system of the dynasty, with lords or overlords ruling over worlds as regents below them with royal courts of cryptex and other advisors. The lords will typically rule over an individual world and act as a battlefield commander when either out of favour or otherwise not in a royal court. Whilst overlords can rule many worlds at once, though how many they directly manage probably varies with dynastic size and personal taste. Meanwhile, Phaerons are leaders of dynasties so widespread that entire sectors are under their rule, with regular overlords quote unquote, forming their course of advisors. Such is their influence that there are probably millions of Necrons both awakened and dormant under their command, but the political gains of their subordinates means that backs must always be watched, even with the power of revification technology. The number of dynasties across the galaxy is a major unknown, probably something that almost every race would like to know, just to give them a better idea of how many Necrons are out there, either waking up or still in hibernation. It's a number that has probably risen and fallen many, many times. Between civil wars, the wars with the old ones, the overthrowing of the Catan, and the simple passing of time, many noble lines will have been wiped from history by nature or by conflict. Some suspect the number of dynasties runs into the hundreds, despite being much higher in the past, but I don't really know where that number comes from, since the territory held by a dynasty is very variable, we don't have a distribution across the galaxy, so we can't really do averaging and any good bits of guesswork. So, let's take a look at some famous dynasties, their main leaders, and their holdings across the galaxy. The largest and most powerful of them all is the Sautek dynasty, or Sautek, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Their crown world is the tomb world known as Mandragora in Eastern Ultima Segmentum's Vidar sector. Its stasis crypts were supposedly filled with some of the best warriors the Necrons had, making me think that the dynasty was already a powerful military force in the Necron tier and the War in Heaven days. It's believed by some to be the third most powerful back then, but its worlds have survived the eons better than its former superiors, leaving the Saltek the strongest of all. Mind you, the power of the Saltek dynasty is not just concentrated on Mandragora. Sure, that's the core of things, but the dynasty has a vast empire by the standards of their peers. In total, we believe that the Saltek hold 80 tomb worlds, give or take, plus however many systems those worlds are able to rule over, and whilst that's nothing compared to the millions, billions of worlds in the Imperium, it's larger than the combined Tau Empire and Farset Enclave Sept worlds, as far as I recall. And even when you've accounted for all the massive legions of warriors on those worlds, there's still more within the Saltek dynasty's military forces. They have what are known as client dynasties, vassals if you like, who have sworn allegiance to the Sautek. There are three that we know of, 
The Horth dynasty is a total unknown pretty much, but the Sekemtar dynasty have been a client since before the days of the Necrons, possibly before the Catan met the Necron tier, as they were conquered during the wars of secession that were finished by the time of the war in heaven. At the other end of the scale, the Arin Maroc were only brought under the Sautek boot in mid to late M41 after being bailed out from an Eldari invasion. Whilst these client dynasties are undoubtedly much weaker than the Sautek, that's still at least one more tomb world each to further bolster their liege. Further reinforcing the difference in approach and personality from dynasty to dynasty, the leaders of the Sautek are among the most expansionist of all Necrons. They're always looking for ways to increase their sphere of influence, enslaving or exterminating as they go to try and restore the ancient Necron Empire. This frequent contact with others, relatively speaking at least, combined with their vast size, has made some individuals think that the Sautek dynasty are the Necrons, as in they represent the entire race, with all other dynasties being simple offshoots. This is obviously very untrue, there were two dynasties more powerful back before the Great Sleep as the Necrons call it, but when you take away the Silent King and the Triarch from the equation, you can begin to perhaps see where the confusion comes from, since most people don't know what happened millions of years ago. The Pharaon of the Sautek dynasty is Imhotek the Stormlord, who we have talked about in a long past log. In short, he was one of, if not the overall leader of Mandragora before the Great Sleep, and certainly he was the one to take command, and then out more infighting to solidify that command, after his awakening in 781-M41. His armies are vast, and his campaigns even more so, and his impeccable hyperlogical strategy makes him a nightmare to fight, unless you're an orc because they don't really know what strategy is. I suspect that should the pair cross paths, the Silent King would be plenty impressed with Imhotek for his philosophy of expansion. Though I'd be curious to see if the Pharaoh has an opinion on a reverse biotransference that heavily weighed on Cesarek's mind, the name of the former Silent King, I forgot to mention that, as he severed the command protocols. Another famous Saltek overlord is another name we've met before, Nemesor Zandrek of the Tomb World Gibdrim. His own expansion has seen Gidrim's holding incorporate a dozen new systems since his reawakening, but his mind is not as perfectly preserved as, say, Imotex. Due to the Great Sleep causing some unknown damage, Zandrek still believes himself a Necron tier, with all his foes being mere rebels in the Wars of Secession. This means he is one of the most honourable fighters amongst the Necrons, even if his contemporaries would quite happily see him dead for it but his muddling of who's who doesn't make him any less capable as a tactician or as an empire builder. Finally, I want to mention a much lesser lord of the dynasty, an individual known as Nahumek from the Traxis sector, which is supposedly just recently explored by humanity. Whilst the whole of his dynasty are want to conquer the galaxy, Nahumek is even more than that. He doesn't just conquer, he wants to wipe the galaxy clean of all Necron, and by that I mean all organic, life. This is why he seeks to conquer the Sector with whatever legions he can muster, fighting against what seems to be an all-star hero's gallery of famous faces from across the galaxy. I can't prove they're all there, but some might be, especially with the time-bending of the Cicatrix Maledictum more recently. However, Nahumek isn't just a genocidal murder bot, he's also a cunning genocidal murder bot who knows something or two about resource conservation if you want to be exceptionally callous. You see, rather than just purge the worlds he conquers, he enslaves the population and uses them as soldiers alongside his mechanical legions. Not out of sentimentality, just to use as chaff and a way of speeding up the conquering and then the harvesting process. It's chilling, I know, it's horrifying, but when you're an organic hating robot ruled by presumably logic above all, it makes about as much sense as we can probably understand. Whilst the Sautek dynasty represents the expansionist mindset common to many Necrons, for a long time the Nealak dynasty represented broadly the opposite, isolationism. Its crown world is the tomb world Geddon in southeast Ultima Segmentum, a near untouchable planet due to being stuck in a pocket dimension for much of its orbit. 
It's also said to contain the head of an ancient prophet that the Nearlark used to predict the future, but I haven't heard tell of them doing anything that crazy with the ability, and chronomancers are a thing amongst the cryptics anyway, so it's not exactly unique to them. Whilst we don't know anything of other Nearlark worlds, we know that many of them will be what are classed as treasure worlds. The dynasty is believed to have conquered many civilizations in the Necron tier days and looted their vast holdings for themselves. Their powerful weaponry and extreme arrogance betrays the rumour that the Nealark are richer than all dynasties combined, and this wealth, whether the rumour is true or not, has turned the dynasty into hoarders and isolationists extraordinaire. They defend their territory with their massive and undepleted military and exceptional vigour, but as long as you've stayed clear of their turf, you'd likely have never known they were there, at least until recently. Their current Phaeron, an individual known as Crispec, not the original Phaeron I assume, has begun changing the policy of the dynasty from isolationist to expansionist. I assume there are many opponents to the idea given they've been isolated for millennia, but the change is happening regardless, and one of the main targets in recent times has been the forces of chaos. The Nealark armies have been cordoning off and building slash forcing others to build monuments across an entire sector of space. I assume these are pylons or similar constructs and attempt to contain the rampant armies of the warp as well as the Cicatrix Maledictum, but I'm not going to go running that cordon to find out for sure. Another famous dynasty from Ultima Segmentum is the Mephrit dynasty, though this one is often more to the northeast of the Segmentum, just northeast of the galactic core by my estimates. Unlike the Sautek or the Neolark, the Mephrit are an interesting bunch because they don't have a Phaeron, or perhaps even an official crown world to call home. This wasn't anything to do with the Necrons, but rather the Eldari. An assassin was somehow able to infiltrate the tomb of their Phaeron, the ironically titled Kyrek the Eternal, and destroy them in the Great Sleep. As a result, the overlords before the now dead Kyrek have been attempting to take the title of Phaeron for themselves. As it stands, the overlord of the tomb world Perdita, Zarathusa the Ineffable, is at the forefront, but nothing seems locked in at this time. The doctrines of the Mephrit hail back to their role in the forces of the Necron Tier. The Silent King would use them as a tool of annihilation to deal with troublesome worlds, kind of like the Space Wars, but with more super weapons. And I do mean super weapons. The Mephrit's calling card is stellar destruction and manipulation, and they have vast weapons capable of sending a star supernova or that harness unleashing and captive ones. You think I'm joking? Take the Jade Overlord of the Tomb World Jagos. This madman laid waste to a vast region of space, destroying every star and planet within 12 light years of their world. And the reason why wasn't about protection or similar things like that. They just wanted a good night's sleep. They didn't want to be disturbed. Yeah, light years of space annihilated so a murder bot got an undisturbed nap. Wow. The Mephrit still use this tech from time to time today, most notably in the Cryptus campaign not long before the coming of the Cicatrix Maledictum. After being awoken by the Roven Angrakir the Traveller, who allied with Overlord Zarathusa, the Necrons allied with the Blood Angels in an attempt to destroy the oncoming splinter of High Fleet Leviathan as it moved toward Baal, home of the Sons of Sanguinius. They probably didn't fight the Great Devourer that much, certainly not compared to the Blood Angels and their successors, but they were able to harness the weapon known as the Magno Vitrium, or Star Flame, to ignite the core of the star in the system and incinerate pretty much everything in it. Finally, let's conclude this little investigation with a look at a dynasty seeking a transference all of their own, the Nefrek Dynasty. Their crown world is believed to be the planet of Aryand, a hive world colonised by humans during the Great Sleep, but now back under Necron control. However, records seem to suggest that it was another faction of Necrons, known as the Altim Horde dynasty, that took the planet back, enslaving the populace in 829 M41. I assume, therefore, that the Altim Horde are a vassal of the Nefrek in some way, who surrendered the world to their liege once they had conquered it, but I cannot confirm that, unfortunately. 
The planet and the dynasty as a whole are in Western Ultima Segmentum, just inside Imperium Sanctus, I think. And the location near to the galactic core brings access to huge amounts of energy to supplement the Nephrex prodigious, if not quite near Lark levels of wealth. Their Pharon is an individual known as Silphek, no epithet for once, but the Necron we see today is a shadow of the original who was entombed eons ago. Something went wrong during Silphek's sleep or revification, causing him to lose the majority of his sanity, but either no one is capable of usurping him or is just waiting for a chance to try. However, unlike the supercar dynasty in the Jericho Reach, whose Pharon wasn't fully awakened due to issues involving insanity, Silphek remains awake and active in commanding the Nephrek. In fact, his cryptex have been able to craft him a skin of what is known as Metagold, allowing him to become a being of living light for a short period of time. All Necron warriors now have traces of this to allow them to jump or teleport, if you like, when they're fighting as a Nephrek force. The goal of the Pharaon now is to make the transformation permanent. Rather than seeking biotransference into a new organic form as the Silent King was hoping, the Nephrek dynasty seeks a celestial transference instead. In fact, Silphek already sees himself as a celestial being as opposed to a machine. I did say he was lacking in sanity, didn't I? And there you have it, a look into the dynasties of the Necron, how they were created, and how they operate both today and partially in the days of the Necron tier. The dynasties represent perhaps the greatest reminder of the Necron tier empire, aside from the personalities within them. And though many have been lost over the eons or withered in power due to the entropy of time, there are many who still present powerful threats all across the galaxy. However, the loss of the command protocol severed by the Silent King means that the dynasties do not necessarily stand united, and one could argue that these differences in opinion will prevent the Necron race from truly assuming galactic dominance again. Now, we've gone very mechanical again for these last few logs, so I think it's right to go back to something more organic for the next one. And I have an ideal candidate, a group I've referenced or mentioned so many times that I really should have probably explained it by now. So that's what we're going to do, explore the history and role of one of the most powerful entities in Imperial history, both before and after the internment of the Emperor. For now, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.